All right, first uh, panel session of the morning. I, I've been involved with a couple of efforts up in Canada. I got invited by the National Energy Board of Canada, I think it was two years ago, to, to speak at a large uh, a safety forum they were holding in Calgary. And, um, you know, I always agree to these things over the phone, and then I get on the airplane heading that direction, and I think, what have I got myself into? And I, I, I get in a cab, and I get off an airplane, get into a cab, and I'm driven right to the place, and I walk into this ballroom, which is huge, and there must have been five or six hundred people there, and I said, okay, who's from the public? And it was like I was standing there by myself with five or six hundred, you know, industry folks. And it's like, well, this is going to be interesting because I'm supposed to talk to them about how transparent they are, and they're not very transparent in Canada, which is kind of what I came out and said to them, and then I was ready to run for the door. Um, and, but as you know, our, our neighbors to the north tend to be way more polite than we are here in the U.S., and, and they treated me well. Uh, and then not too long after that, I was invited by the uh, Canadian Energy Pipeline Association to join an external advisory panel they were forming. And so we're going to hear about those two efforts. And, and the reason especially that I asked the NEB to come this morning was they have a couple of efforts going on up there that are different than what we've seen here in the U.S., the way they involve people in their pipeline siting and routing things. Um, there's lots of concern about pipeline siting and routing here in the country and how it ought to happen. Um, and they do it a little differently up there. They actually help pay people to be part of that, those discussions. And then they have a landowner effort uh, where they're reaching out about landowners' rights that is much more robust than what we've seen here in the U.S. And I think Dan is going to talk about both of those. So I'll quit wasting any more time here, and I'll just like to invite uh, Dana Cornia, who's the Director of Applications for the National Energy Board of Canada. Up and down buttons. Thanks, Carl. Um, Yes, I, I was actually the one who invited Carl up to the safety forum, and uh, we really, Carl's had a big impact, I think, uh, at least on the National Energy Board, and as a result of the safety forum, we have a public commitment to uh, improve our transparency, and um, I, the time has come, so thank you, Carl. Um, so I'll just explain first a little bit about the National Energy Board, who we are. Um, the, uh, we're an independent federal regulator. We were established in 1959. We promote safety, security, environmental protection, and economic efficiency. We're basically FIMSA and FERC together in one organization. Um, the NEB, we work in the public interest. We have a mandate that's set by the Parliament of Canada, and uh, we regulate uh, international interprovincial pipelines, international and designated interprovincial power lines. Uh, we regulate the import and export of gas, oil, natural gas, liquids, and electricity. And we also do pipeline tariff, uh, tariffs, tolls, traffic, and as well as oil and gas exploration and production in Canada's north and certain offshore areas. Um, we operate like a court of record, and uh, I mentioned we're independent from government. Um, the, the National Energy Board is uh, dedicated to having public participation in our hearings. It's a fundamental part of uh, our review processes. It contributes to an open and balanced regulatory process. It strengthens the quality and credibility of our process. Uh, the public is an important source of local and traditional knowledge about a project's physical site and potential impacts. It's through meaningful public participation activities that project proponents can obtain information, better understand and respond to public concerns, and inform people about decisions. So all our project assessments are public, and um, we support participation in our hearings through uh, having process advisors available to answer questions uh, on the process, and, um, and then we also offer a modest participant funding program. Um, in order to participate in our hearings, you must be directly affected uh, by the proposed project or you might have relevant information or expertise for the board to consider, or you could be both of that. Um, if you, if you uh, do participate you, um, and apply to be an intervener, then you are eligible for participant funding, but it, you have to be an intervener. Um, 
you, the public may file letters of comments that, and if they're not uh, interveners, uh, those letter of comments will be looked at by the panel. Um, but you're not eligible for funding if you um, if you're not an intervener. So a little bit about our participant funding program. Um, it was established in 2010, so not too long ago. Uh, it's for individuals, nonprofits, and non-industry groups. The objective is to support effective and meaningful participation in our hearings. We have a budget of about 1.4 million uh, baseline. That's Canadian dollars. Um, and for major projects, we'll get incremental funding. Uh, we are independent. We, we are not only independent from government as an organization, but we're also independent from the hearing process. So our staff is um, kind of a firewalled from the hearing um, process. We establish that accountability through our organization. Um, we also have established an independent funding review committee. Two of the three members must be from outside of the NEB. And they're often experts and uh, pr um, professors and that kind of thing, understand Aboriginal issues and, uh, and uh, energy issues. Um, it's, the program is not intended to cover the full cost of participation. It's a modest program. Um, and uh, I'd say we averaged about 20 applications a year up until last year. And this year is going to be over 100. So as an organization or as a program, we're really struggling to uh, expand and uh, adapt our processes to remain efficient um, because of this just incredible exponential growth in um, public participation in our processes. Um, there's approximately 80% of our funding goes to Aboriginal groups in Canada. Oops. Sorry. The, the, uh, the other public participation that we do um, that's not in the hearing is we have a land matters group. Uh, it's an advisory group, multi-stakeholder. Um, we established this group just a couple of years ago and um, really came out of a huge cross-country consultation initiative we did with landowners and companies and uh, environmental groups as well. Um, the, it has three objectives. Uh, it builds awareness and interest in land matters. It encourages a fuller exchange of information among the stakeholders in the land matters group. It promotes and facilitates an in-depth discussion and recommendations on land matters. And it informs our regulatory development, priority setting, and program delivery decisions that are made by the board. We really try to use this group um, effectively to inform policy and regulation. Just some examples of uh, topics we've covered with the Land Matters Group we're covering right now, uh, SEPA, our, our Energy Pipeline Association, Jim Donahue's from there, uh, they put forward a land agent code of conduct. They uh, use the LMG to uh, inform and to gather feedback on it. Um, we gave our recent draft of damage prevention regulations to this group and solicited their input on, on those and they're now going through the regulatory process. Um, we are in the process of looking at a policy, a deeper policy statement about how we use penalties with landowners. Uh, they do have obligations under our current crossing regulations, so um, violations of that are subject to penalties and landowners would like greater clarity around how they'll be used. And um, also we're looking at...